So I'd mentioned that Diffie and Hellman sounded a bit disappointed that they hadn't found an encryption system, but only a key exchange. Now, um, Algamau found a way to use the cryptographic primitive for this discrete logarithm problem. And actually what he's using in the end is the computational Diffie Hellman problem in order to build an encryption system and a signature system. So you can actually build those also based on discrete logarithms. Um, nowadays, as I mentioned in the Diffie Hellman lecture, we typically use a static or semi-static Diffie Hellman key exchange or ephemeral or some more complicated concoctions where you're having uh, a combination of, of, uh, of long-term and short-term keys. Um, but for historical purposes, you shouldn't be leaving a cryptography course without having seen algorithm encryption. Now, let me start in this case with the bottom parts. So there are some positives and there are some downsides. So you might want to use the algorithm encryption system if you actually want to have a homomorphic system. The downside is also this is homomorphic, so that means it's not one way CCA to secure. So that is a typical thing whenever you have a homomorphic system. You don't get that security notion, but if you want a homomorphic system, here is another possibility. Another downside, and that might be more of an issue, is that it requires that the message is inside the group. Now, when you go back to the Diffie Hellman setting, where they say, okay, they're taking the multiplicity of group of a finite field and they want the generator to generate the entire multiplicity of group, so it's a primitive element, then this is a very small restriction. That basically means the message is not allowed to be zero. And zero wouldn't be a good message to encrypt anyway, as we see soon. And okay, a positive thing in this case is that it's a randomized scheme. It is randomized that helps you for anything but for zero. Now, after all these precautions, let's see how the scheme works. So it is basically doing a Diffie Hellman key exchange and then pushing in the message somehow. So Alice, just like in the Fehrmann system, has a public key and a private key. And again, her public key is G to the A, her private key is A. And then any user can encrypt a message to Alice. And the beginning here looks just like in the uh, semi-static Diffie-Hellman key exchange. So the sender picks a random K, computes R, which is G to the K, exactly the same. And then also the sender computes Alice's public key, the g to the a, to this random power k. And so this g to the a to the k is just like in the semi-static diffie hellman key exchange, their shared secret. Now what happens in algorithm encryption is that that gets simply multiplied by m. So that's where it is important that the message lives in the group. Now, if your group is actually not the full multiplicative group, then you might have some issues to massage it to get in there. Now for functionality, it would still work, but for security, if this element suddenly has a different order, you would give away too much information about the message. So this is both the kind of much easier than pulling out the full power of symmetric key cryptography, but also this is the part where it's much more vulnerable, where you're having some homomorphic structure, where you're having algebraic structure, just m times the diffie hellman key, uh, shared to Hamann key, that is typically too dangerous. So, well, I'm saying algorithms for historical purpose, unless you really know what you're doing. Now to decrypt, well, Alice, we have said already, can get this g to the ak uh, by taking the sender's r, which is g to the k, to her secret power a. And then the ciphertext is that thing times m. So she takes the ciphertext, divides by the shared key, and that gives her M. So it is fairly simple. In hindsight, it's a feeling like, yeah, of course, this is how you can encrypt something. But it's also kind of touchy in that, well, you could now also from there encrypt more things. You can multiply server text in a certain way. And so be careful when using this. Now, algorithm signatures are more commonly used. So they are the basis of the common um, digital signature algorithm, DSA, and then the elliptic curve versions and so on. Um, there are lots of different ways of how you can write the signing equation. The way I put it here is what Al Gamal had in his initial paper. I'm by no means saying that this is the best. It's actually not so nice 
because you do need to compute inverses modulo the order of, of g. So over here, um, this L here, that's going to be my name for the order of g. Now, I said already that for security purposes, we like to have that the order of g is a prime. And now we also get a functionality reason uh, why we want it to be prime, because then the inverse of k actually does exist for well any non-zero k. There are some versions of Algamal where things get shifted around a little bit differently, which don't require inversion. But Algamal's original signature scheme does, and also the DSA and the ECDSA version. Other than that, well, it starts the same way as everything else. So Alice has a public key, private key pair, which is just the discrete log problem. So public key is g to the a, private key is a. And then to sign a message, we need to have something which involves Alice's a. So something which only she can sign. Now, this one is non-obvious of how to do. So the beginning is again similar to what the development key exchange is doing. So she picks a random k, she computes g to the k, calls it r. But then how this k and this r get into the next equation is kind of weird. So the um, k, okay, that is an exponent, so that is naturally an integer modulo the order of g. And so that is invertible mod l unless it's zero. And then Okay, we can compute the hash of the message, and we assume that the hash function maps to something suitably some numbers mod of L. And the A is an exponent of G, so that is also again something from the group of elements or the set of elements mod L. But then this A here gets multiplied by R. And that is another really weird thing. So R is actually an element modulo P. And Computing modulo p and modulo divisor of p minus 1, which this L has to be, don't have much in common. So that is a moment where things can go wrong, where you feel like, hey, it really matters which of the representatives I'm choosing if I would be using um, a negative representation or a centered around zero representation, I would be computing something different from other people. So we all have to agree what this R is. Now it's not so bad because you're sending this R, and so everybody knows what representation of R you're choosing. You're encoding your R as an integer, and so you're taking your number, which has been a number mod P, and you're sending it as an integer. And everybody has to use the same R as you send it here, so else this equation will not hold. And then to verify the signature, it's this expression. So when you're getting a message from Alice, you want to verify that she really is Alice. Now, you don't know her lowercase a, but you know her public key, h sub a. And so what you're going to compute is taking g, the generator, to the h of the message, minus r, which is sent to the s. So those are the two signature parts, this r to the s there. And you're also taking her public key to the r. And if this difference is zero, everything computed, modulo p because it's in the or in the group g so typically you're working in the integers mod p so this equation is mod p signing equation is modulo l now of course a signature scheme only is any good if uh, valid signatures actually get through so let's check why valid signatures should get accepted so let's take a look at the right hand side there as this r to the s times alice's key to the r. Okay, that one we can write as r to the s, so r to start with is g to the k, and then s, that was a signing equation up there, that is k inverse times h of m minus a r. Okay, so I put those in there, and then Alice's public key is g to the a, and I'm raising this to the r. So I've just expanded all those pieces, nothing yet went in there. And now I have to do one sanity check. So I'm in the exponents. So in the exponents, everything is modulo the order of g. Now that is modulo r, uh, modulo l. And yes, my s was defined to be this k inverse times h of m minus a r, 
modulo L. So it is okay to use it up there. And then taking K times K inverse actually does give you one. So the first part simplifies to H of M minus AR, and then you're getting a plus AR from the second term. And so you're just getting G to the H of M. And well, okay, if you're checking that G to the H of M minus this thing is zero, then yes, this will always be zero because, well, I was actually put in the secret key. Now, if you don't know the secret key, then your problem is how you compute this valid signature so that this equation there holds. Now, you have full control over the messages, you have full control of the R and therefore of the K, uh, of the K and therefore of the R, but getting this relationship for the S from all that we know does require a knowing A. And so you can have a security proof that breaking this is as hard as solving the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem. So those are the two Agamal systems. Agamal encryption is, well, in my mind, less useful than the semi-static Diffie-Hellman key exchange. And then Agamal signatures are the basis of several of the more modern systems. However, also there we're seeing slightly better ones that are based on systems to Schnorr. Um, better ones meaning you don't need to have this inversion modulo L and better ones in that um, you're having better properties against uh, collision attacks on the hash functions for instance. But this is good enough to have one example of a, of a discrete logarithm based encryption system and of a discrete logarithm based signature system.